Good afternoon, welcome, and thanks for joining us for today's HIS Talk webinar, Pairing a High-Tech Clinical Logistics Center with a Communication Platform for Quick Patient Response. It's brought to you by Volt and Zebra. I'm Lori from HIS Talk, and I'll be moderating. We have two speakers today. First up will be James Shatterer. James is a health informatics supervisor at Nemours Children's Health System. Joining James will be Mark Chamberlain. Mark is a clinical applications analyst also at Nemours Children Health System. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, James. Great, thank you, Lori. As she said, uh, my name is James Schnatterer and I have been with Nemours for more than 25 years and in the healthcare industry, uh, I hate to say this, but over 30 years. Um, my co-presenter, Mark Chamberlain, has been with Nemours for the past eight years, and Mark helped to build most of what we are presenting today. So I hope you uh, enjoy the presentation, and again, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to attend today. So Nemours was founded in 1936, and our first hospital was built on the grounds of Mr. Alfred I. DuPont's estate in Wilmington, Delaware and we opened the doors to our first hospital in 1940. Our second hospital, the Nemours Children's Hospital, uh, was opened in 2012 and is located in Orlando, Florida. We have specialty care centers across the entire Delaware Valley and the state of Florida and continue to grow and expand and are uh, now exceeding 8,000 associates throughout our health system. Nemours is one of the nation's leading pediatric health systems. We provide care for more than 410,000 unique patients with close to 2 million encounters annually. We are leading the way to help children grow up healthy using a holistic and multifaceted approach to reach children and families where they live, learn, work, and play. The picture you see on the screen, uh, the, the hospital on the upper, on the top part, is the uh, Alfred I. DuPont Hospital for Children, which is still located on the grounds of Mr. DuPont's uh, uh, huge estate. And um, on the bottom screen is the Nemours Children's Hospital. The different lights, colors of the lights that you see in the, on the patient rooms are actually controlled by the patients themselves. They can set the, the mood for their room by changing the colors themselves. So it does look really, really cool at night when you're driving through Orlando. We're going to talk to you today about levering technology as extra eyes and ears for the nurses on our inpatient units. This is a picture of our clinical logistics center. It is located at the Nemours Children's Hospital in Orlando, Florida, and the medics that you see throughout the room are our nurses' second set of eyes and ears. Uh, from the Logistics Center in Orlando, uh, the paramedics monitor patients at both hospitals in Wilmington and in Orlando. They can monitor up to 400 patients around the clock, and they um, are able to see if any of the patients display signs of difficulty. They can initiate codes, staff assist for immediate assistance on the units, and we do this not only by monitoring the, the, all of the screens that you see there, but we also have high definition cameras that are accessible by the medics. And I'm gonna go into more detail about that later in the presentation, but that is the Clinical Logistics Center. Um, we wanted to just mention right off the bat some success stories with by using our clinical logistics center. We've been able to catch seizures when no one is around, uh, zero delays to get the patients the help they need exactly when they need it. Early warning signs during a blood transfusion uh, catches blood transfusion reactions. Uh, a text to the nurse about a lead placement or rhythm changes results in doctor interventions and real-time charting Real-time chart auditing confirm national standards and protocols are being followed. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark to go into more detail about how we've been able to pull this off. Thank you, James. 
All right, so uh, what you see here, of course, is the uh, logistics center that James already covered. Um, at each of these workstations, uh, staff is logged into uh, several applications at all times. Uh, Volt Messenger uh, for texting in Volt with the staff. Uh, they're also logged into Volt One on a TC51, a Zebra TC51 for alarm escalation. Uh, logged into Spoke Messenger, which is our middleware uh, for sending urgent alerts or uh, notifications to preset groups in that system. Uh, they're also logged into TalkGuard uh, from Guard RFID, which is our patient tracking system. They're logged into Responder 5, our nurse call system, into Epic, uh, which is our EMR, uh, ICU monitor, and of course, email. Uh, we are staffed with uh, licensed paramedics. We work 10 to 16 hour shifts with breaks every four hours. Um, so there are five workstations in the room. Uh, three are dedicated to Alfred I. DuPont in Wilmington, Delaware, and then two dedicated to NCH Orlando, and that's uh, based on census. Um, the sixth workstation you see in the top left, uh, that is the work area for our house supervisor. So this is a list of uh, the most impactful responsibilities of the paramedics in the logistics center, um, physiologic monitoring, of course, uh, protocol-driven responses. And some of those responses are initiated by clinical rules surveyed by uh, EPIC Monitor, you see below, uh, CLAPSI, CAUTI, neonatal sepsis, and PUSE. So here's a diagram of how we integrate the systems to notify the nurse or care team member of an event in the patient room. Uh, for a red alarm event at the Phillips monitor, a vent alarm or a patient call from the Responder 5 nurse call system, we send those events to Spoke, which contain the assignments for the correct nurse or care team member to receive the alarm. Uh, from there, Spoke sends to the Volt device that the nurse or care team member is carrying, and then this will tie in with the logistics center as they are assigned to the last tier of escalation. So this is our uh, Phillips patient monitoring presence in the logistics center. Um, nursing leadership at uh, NCH in Orlando opted for no monitoring at the nurses stations on the med surge units and the HEMOC unit, uh, which means that on that big wall there, those big screen TVs are uh, the central stations for the med surge units, um, and that's making up 72 uh, locked sectors. Uh, all the sectors on the wall there are locked. There is no uh, keyboard or mouse option for those large uh, flat screen TVs. Uh, for EA AIDHC, uh, there's only overview stations in this room as the central stations are on the units up there. And there is a one gig circuit uh, that's used to connect the logistics center to AIDHC with backup uh, routing options through a major networking hub of ours in Jacksonville. So both hospitals, we send patient monitoring alarms to Volt One and Volt Me users. Uh, we only send specific red alarms to uh, better manage alarm fatigue. Our middleware provides uh, the escalation process. Uh, it gives the nurses the ability to immediately escalate if they're not available to respond. Um, and then if they, the, the alert goes, not, goes unresponded to, then the system will auto escalate at 30 seconds. Um, charge nurses and the logistics medics are the last tier of escalation. Uh, the medics process for responding once they receive an alert is to message the nurse. And if no, no response is received, then they'll go ahead and call the nurse directly. So here's a flow chart that represents uh, the paramedics workflow in response to a Paul Sox alarm, as you can see, which could ultimately lead to uh, activating a code blue or a rapid response. At both hospitals, we use the Responder 5 nurse call system. Of course, there are 100 devices installed at both hospitals. Uh, in the logistics center, each workstation has a responder console phone that you see in the bottom right. Uh, this device identifies the event uh, with the event type and location. It also allows for communication into the patient room. Uh, the medic can connect to the pillow speaker and headwall unit into the patient room to have a conversation with the patient and family.
Uh, we use a, a remote network concentrator provided by Roland. Uh, this converts the Responder 5 Layer 2 traffic uh, to layer, through, layer 3 on our network, uh, and then vice versa when that traffic reaches the other facility. Uh, the medics are part of the primary notification for these urgent events. Um, and we'll audio and video into the room to assist with the response by monitoring compressions or acting as a messenger uh, to contact a lab or imaging or another provider if needed. So I want to dive into an integration uh, we use to give the nurses the ability to call into the patient's room uh, to converse with the patient and family. Uh, this is prompted by a nurse call alert uh, being activated from the, from the patient, uh, either a nurse or water or toilet or pain uh, from the pillow speaker. As you can see on the device on the screen, uh, that is the alert which is received with the three options of accept, reject, and accept and call. Uh, accept ends the escalation process giving uh, the nurse that responded ownership of that call. Uh, reject uh, would let the escalation process take over and immediately escalate to the next person. And accept and call uh, stops the escalation process but also uh, initiates a call uh, in directly into the patient's room. So how this is accomplished is uh, through this diagram here. So the alert is initiated from the nurse call device. Um, that alert uh, from Responder 5 uh, goes into Spoke and it includes the dial pattern uh, for that room and via Spoke is sent to the appropriate uh, care team member uh, to their vault. Uh, when the accepting call is selected, um, it still has the, the alert still contains that, that dial pattern, and which is sent to our Cisco call manager. Um, from there, the Cisco call manager recognizes the, the prefix and is sent to the Roland uh, SIP server. Uh, once it's received by Roland, uh, the SIP server chops off that prefix um, and then identifies the room to connect the call to and sends it on to the, uh, to the devices in the room. Now, from the Volt phone, this just sounds like a regular telephone call. However, in the room, it's an intercom conversation uh, so that the nurse can speak with um, the patient and the family in the room. Spoke Messenger is our middleware, both locations, processing the patient monitoring and nurse call, nurse call alarms to Volt. Um, at NCH in Orlando, the medics use the middleware client uh, to send codes, census notifications and updates, uh, equipment outages, uh, or even notification that an, an inspector has arrived on site. Uh, these messages are sent to various groups and spoke, and these groups are static, uh, meaning that they're preset, they're not edited between shifts. Uh, and thanks to Volt Platform, we, will, we were able to replace messaging to this managed Volt Blast group and spoke uh, with the send announcement option, uh, which is a quick and easy way to send a message to all Volt users online. Wanted to share about another way we leveraged this integration for a continuous improvement project uh, that we had at NCH last year. We wanted to focus on discharge planning at admission, uh, communication across the care team, and coordination of the room turnover process. Uh, so we created four room turnover buttons on the staff terminal, so you see at the, the top right there. Uh, we have one of those in each of the inpatient rooms. Uh, we created room dirty, cleaning in progress, room clean, room ready, uh, to capture each, uh, each step of the turnover process. Um, so room ready, notifies environmental services that the room is now empty and also or notifies the logistics center that the discharge has occurred and it updates uh, the room in our EMR as dirty. Uh, so when cleaning and progress is pressed, it notifies um, environmental services management that the environmental services tech has arrived to clean the room. Uh, and then when room clean is pressed, uh, it identifies or notifies the EVS management that that tech is complete. And it also notifies um, our patient care techs or nurses aides uh, that the room is ready for the finishing touches uh, prior to the next patient. 
and this also updates our EMR uh, that the room is clean but not yet ready. And then of course room ready notifies the house supervisor, the units, a charge nurse, and the logistics center that the room is ready for the next patient uh, and then changes that bed status in our EMR uh, to ready. Um, we use rules like uh, the next button cancels the previous button to mitigate issues uh, with it being a manual process. Um, our CI team has been uh, collecting data since we went live, and I'm looking forward to see uh, how we've improved the turnover times. So at this point, I'd like to turn it back over to James uh, to share about uh, integrating data from uh, the EHR. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. So our electronic health record is EPIC. So we use EPIC and we refer to that as EPIC Nemours 1. Uh, that's what all the associates call it. And that's any of our notifiers that go out. We refer to it as EPIC Nemours 1. And it allows for seamless integration because we have one uh, EHR database for our entire enterprise, uh, both in Florida and Delaware, and the Clinical Logistics Center uses the EPIC data to provide an added level of patient safety, um, which allows them to do their 24-7 monitoring of our patients at both hospitals. So this is EPIC Monitor, and EPIC Monitor displays in table format alerts designed to detect real-time specific patient characteristics within the EMR to the paramedic. So for example, the combination of fever and an elevated white blood cell count in a patient with a central venous catheter alerts the paramedic to search the EMR for specific antibiotics to avoid a central line associated bloodstream infection. Um, the pews entered by the nurse are also electronically tracked to assure proper escalation of monitoring and potentially higher level of care if, if needed. So predict predictive analytics helps to prevent hospital acquired infections such as CLAPSI and CAUTI. And we're able to, to do that with EPIC Monitor. We had mentioned, or I had mentioned earlier that we have high definition cameras in the rooms. So the bubble in the middle is what the camera looks like in the, in the ceiling in the room and the the screenshot or the picture on the right is the view that the medic would have uh, in the clinical logistics center. Um, that camera can zoom in and view the rise and fall of a patient's chest, uh, can, can zoom in pretty much anywhere in the room. And the audio connection that we have is done through the Responder 5 system that Mark was talking about. And the medic can call direct right to the pillow speaker to converse with the patient and family. Uh, the medic can confirm by direct visual confirmation of the patient through bedside through these bedside cameras to distinguish true alarms from nuisance false alarms and they can do it in real time. Uh, this technology allows for hands-free voice communication by the bedside staff in the room uh, during acute clinical crisis and or resuscitation. So they can give um, direction to the medics in the uh, logistics center if they need assistance, if they need someone contacted, if they need something looked at in the chart, um, they can do that, you know, simply by um, conversing directly with the medic. So alarm desensitization becomes an increasingly common risk to patients. So uh, better, the failure to appreciate, acknowledge, or respond to alarm is alarm fatigue. So we, to give you an idea, out of 1,137 total physiological alarms, 21% or 244 of those alarms were false alarms. 18% of those alarms had actions taken by the paramedics. And just to give you an idea of alarm fatigue, um, the, the, the major concern or issue with alarm fatigue is the Joint Commission identified alarm fatigue as a primary cause for 80 hospital deaths reported between 2009 and 2012. So we, we wanted to dive into the alarms that, that the medics are responding to. And 
wanted to also show that 72% of the actions um, resulted in either an audio visual, an audio or a visual communication um, with the room itself, with the patient's room. 21% of those 115 communications were audio only, and then 79% of those communications were audio and visual. So here's a breakdown of those 115 alarms that 66% uh, were um, low SpO2, 17% tachycardia, 10% uh, bradycardia, 7% were for other reasons. And from those 115 that required a medic response, uh, 45 of them required a secondary action by the medic, 26 were text to providers via Volt Me, and 17 were phone calls to the nurse's Volt devices, and in two cases, a rapid response was initiated. So here is the initial action and the secondary action performed by the medic and the resulting clinical intervention. Um, so for example, a low pulse ox alarm led to audiovisual communication. A call to the unit resulted in an increase of supplemental oxygen. Um, a high heart rate alarm led to uh, audio visual communication and the ordering of labs and lab tests and IV fluids. So we mentioned we use the Volt platform and Zebra's TC51 handheld computers. Uh, we have over 800 shared um, Zebra TC51s and with the Volt 1 app on it and another 550 personal physician smartphones with the Volt Me app. We recently made the switch from a consumer grade smartphone to the Zebra TC51 for our enterprise. Um, the TC51 is extremely durable. It's made for everyday clinical use, and, and the clinical staff really love their new devices for a number of reasons, especially because the battery remains charged for their entire 12-hour shift. So once they pick up their device at the beginning of shift, they have that device the entire time. It doesn't need to be redocked. They have it on their body for their entire shift. Uh, they also love it because uh, when they drop the device, which does happen, it, it, it doesn't break. And from a support end, we like that as well because it, it, it has reduced the number of, of call outs to uh, replace a shattered screen on a, on a consumer grade smartphone versus this hospital grade device. And the clinical staff, the other thing that they love about this device is they can clean it without worry using all of the same cleaning um, uh, products that they have on the inpatient unit to clean all of the other hospital equipment they have. Uh, they just consider this another piece of hospital equipment and, and use the same cleaners. Derek, one of our PICU charge nurses states, I wouldn't feel comfortable walking away to another room if I didn't have my Volt phone with me. Having peace of mind that Volt will instantly notify me of any critical alarms is comforting and alleviates anxiety. Dr. Torres, our chief of the NICU at NCH, our hospital in Orlando, added, Volt allows us to take inefficiencies of communicating out of the equation. So the Clinical Logistics Center has been a big success and we are in the process, uh, it's, it's been such a big success that we're in the process of building a, a second Clinical Logistics Center at our hospital in Delaware and then each of those clinical logistics centers will act as a backup for the other. So if we were to have uh, uh, a major hurricane that impacted Central Florida, um, we could still monitor both hospitals from Delaware, or if we had a, a, a nor'easter come through with uh, that in the northeast that, that, that dropped a ton of snow and had some type of an impact uh, in Delaware, we would be able to monitor from, from Orlando as we do now. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our Volt partner for the presentation. Thanks, yeah, thanks, James. Hi, everyone. My name is Angela Kaufman, and I manage our product marketing department here at Volt. 
the Moores is a great customer and a wonderful example of how hospitals around the U.S. are leveraging Volt Platform to improve clinical workflows, patient care, and staff engagement. Our platform is made up of four solutions that you can see on the slide here, collaboration, management, analytics, and integration. The Nemours team highlighted some of these solutions earlier in the webinar, such as our mobile applications, Volt One and Volt Me, our desktop application, Volt Messenger, and of course, the various alarm and alert workflows that Mark and James went through. If you have any questions about the Volt deployment on Zebra devices at Nemours, we'll be providing more information on how to get in contact with us after the webinar. So now I'd actually like to hand it off to Chris Sullivan to share about Zebra Technologies. Chris? Thank you, Angela. And uh, Zebra is very pleased to play a part in this very innovative and strong solution that Volt and Nemours are delivering. Uh, my role at Zebra is the healthcare practice lead. Our company focuses on applying advanced technologies into the healthcare workflow. Uh, we are a global market leader in a diverse range of products, ranging from printers and wristbands and scanners and RFID, handheld computers, and much more. We have over 350 healthcare designed products. Uh, with uh, specific healthcare workflow needs uh, in mind when those products are designed. Uh, we heard an example of that through this uh, story at Nemours with our mobile computer product that is designed for the healthcare environment. Our company focus in healthcare is on three solution areas. One is around patient identity solutions which involves uh, identification accuracy of tasks and people and patients. Secondly, we help assist with clinical mobility solutions, as is highlighted here in this example. And we also provide uh, real-time location solutions and operational intelligence. Uh, recently, we've made some major uh, investments. Uh, in February, we announced the launching, I'm sorry, in February, announced the acquisition of a smart label company named TempTime, which is temperature-sensitive labels. And we also launched an IoT platform in June of 2018, which helps with the flow of information in a seamless, clean way within the healthcare environment. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this session today. All right. Um... We'd like to open it up to the audience now for questions. Please use the questions box in the GoToWebinar console to submit your questions to our speakers. Um, the first question, where and how do you capture output room turnover metrics and make them available for environmental service management? I'll take this one. Um, so actually, that is captured. Um, the all of the room turnover times between each step of the process is captured in the Responder Five uh, system. Um, they do have reporting options, but we we found it more um, efficient to uh, use a reporting tool uh, connecting to the database and just grabbing their uh, the information ourselves. Uh, and we do. Uh, we do turn that over to our contracted EBS company for the turnover times. Mary would like to know, what consumer phone did you use prior to Zebra, and do providers bring their own devices? So providers do not bring their own devices. Providers are issued um, a cu customer-grade regular smartphone, they have the option, well, w what we used before was an uh, iPhone um, with a Mobi battery pack attachment. Um, and what we use now are Nemours issued um, smartphones for the providers that they add, that they carry with them. And uh, we use mobile iron to make sure the device is secure. And then the TC51s are shared on the units by all the supporting staff. 
Mark, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, so we, we went through um, several iPhone uh, versions. We started with the three GSs and then onto the fours, uh, all the version of fours, and then onto the fives, all the versions of fives. Um, but when uh, Mofi had stopped producing the external battery pack is when we began shopping uh, for our next device. And that's, uh, you know, when we compared the two, we, we obviously chose the Zebra TC51 to move forward with after the iPhone 5. All right. Can you tell us a little bit more about your efforts to alleviate alarm fatigue? How do you ensure that nurses and others aren't being interrupted by too many alerts coming to their smartphones? Well, we do have um, an alarm uh, management committee, um, and we meet on a monthly basis to um, kind of review alarms for the previous month, uh, uh, review alarms compared to last year. Uh, we also update on uh, different things between the units that we're trying, uh, I believe, swapping leads. You'll have to excuse me. I'm not clinical. Uh, but there's a number of steps that they're also taking on the floors uh, to reduce the amount of alarms. So I, I'd say it's just something we, we meet regularly about and, and try and keep a close tab on. Mark, did you, did you want to mention the, the different tiers? I think that was, was that part of the question as well. Well, we do. Yeah, we do have uh, tiers of escalation for, for the alerts. Um, so, uh, there's, there's not just, you know, one, um, or the same nurse, uh, that's being alerted, you know, over and over. So there, you know, there is uh, assistance in that, uh, escalation process on the unit and outside of the unit. Pete would like to know if you can explain your change management process for alarming alerting. For example, when you change who gets alerted and how long before an escalation and to who, how does that change process proliferate through the organization? Well, um, it helps with leadership, having a, a good understanding uh, of the alerting process. Um, other, other than that, we like to keep those decisions not really at a uh, unit level, but at a higher level uh, so that the changes do uh, go down to all units. Uh, we try and keep things as similar across the units as possible. We have quite a few nurses that float. Um, so, so really with that under, you know, with their understanding, leadership that is, um, and uh, just the explanation of, of you know the changes to come. Um, then we either we either decide on on possibly a pilot unit um, for a period of time to see if that's the right that's the right way to go. Uh, and then we would uh, coordinate with all managers uh, to get the word out to all staff. And then of course we would use notifications through Volt uh, when that you know time for the change does does occur. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. You mentioned escalation of alarms. When a nurse is busy, how are alarms escalated to the next available person? So built into the escalation process, uh, we have options to auto escalate. Um, if you recall uh, in one of the slides, uh, the reject option is part of the uh, um, is part of the alert for the nurse that receives it. Uh, they can, once they reject it, it is uh, um, escalated automatically, immediately, um, and, or it falls back to the uh, escalation process in the in the system, and that is an option in our in our middleware. All right. Um, do you have a set of guidelines for when the medics should send a text versus when they should pick up the phone and make a call? I believe it's always um, it's always a text first unless it's um, urgent. They can go as far as to um, contact the room directly uh, without any interaction, interaction with anyone on the floor based on uh, what they're receiving. Um, so they could 
uh, audio and video into the room first, actually, um, and then you know determine what's going on, and then reach out to the staff. So depending on the urgency, um, I think you, they try to usually start with start off with the text, um, but if it's uh, if it's an emergency, they will um, call the unit. Sometimes even just go ahead and initiate uh, either a rapid response or a code blue, um, and get that message out to everyone that responds immediately. Thank you. Um, oh, another one just came in. Mike would like to know um, if the speaker can talk more about the Clinical Logistics Center. Where is it located? How is it staffed? Um, who staffs it? And what is the scope of their focus? Uh, so, it was a concept that was part of this hospital um, at construction. Uh, we opened in 2012 here. Um, so this large, you know, two-story sized room um, was part of the part of the construction um, with the design in mind. Um, and we do hire licensed paramedics. Again, I'm sorry, I'm not clinical, but we hire licensed paramedics because they're able to use that training in their responses to, to signs that they receive from the patient. Um, it is staffed 24 seven, all patients at both hospitals are monitored uh, 24 seven. Um, and what was, the, what was the last part of that question? I'm sorry. The, the hospital that it, it's in the, the Morris Children's Hospital in Orlando, Florida. I yeah. think they were asking for which, which hospital, how we manage. Yeah, and they asked about the scope of the focus, which I think you answered when you said every patient. Well, yeah, I mean, and really they're just, they are the second set of eyes and ears for nursing. Um, they even monitor um, patient records uh, to make sure that, James, you might be able to better answer that, but they're really making sure that those records are updated as needed. Uh, so they're really just the, the the second set for for nursing. James, do you yep, want to so add they'll anything? Do, they'll do. Yep, they'll do real time chart audits to make sure protocols are being followed. Um, you know, so there there's because they are in that room twenty four seven. Um, they're they're constantly monitoring all of the monitors that you saw on the, on the screen, as well as then going into the uh, EPIC patient, the patient's chart in EPIC and doing audits as well. Okay. Um, beside communication, what other uh, ways do the nurses use the TC51? We are about to um, pilot the use of Rover, which is an EPIC application. So they will be able to do some patient documenting within the, uh, while using the handheld computer. They'll be able to, when we implement Rover, they'll be doing uh, scanning with the device as well. So they won't need a separate scanner. They can use do scanning capability with the device. Um, Mark, what other apps? We do have they... a couple of, yep, we got a couple extra apps on there. Um, so uh, our radiology department is, is enterprise with their on-call rotation. So we do use Lightning Bolt application on there um, that gives the radiology staff access to that schedule. Uh, we also use an, an application called Ease in our OR, and I guess, and in radiology uh, that allows for our staff to update uh, the families uh, during longer procedures. All right, I'm I'm pausing for a second because each time I think it's the last question, another one comes in. But it does look like that was the last question, um, which will conclude our webinar. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and thank you, James and Mark, for the informative presentation. Attendees, watch your email for links to the recording of today's webinar, as well as a PDF version of the PowerPoint presentation. We look forward to seeing you at our next HIS Talk webinar. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day.
Thank you, everybody.